I'm visible. Okay. Uh, hi, hello, and Manakam. This is Nandakma Krishna Swami, uh, mentor and investor in innovative products and solutions. Your moderator for this session. Uh, this session, uh, this during this pandemic, current pandemic, which has brought about a global state of emergency or an alarm within institutions and businesses trying to find their bearings during and after the aftermath. Investors and startups also face the same challenge, barring a few who have the means to quickly adapt to the constant changes while the ground is constantly shifting under us. We wanted to use this session as a context to explore two things, a couple of things how innovation looks like for a business and technology transfer point of view, where what are the steps and barriers faced along the way, how innovation and entrepreneurship are key to human progress and how the pressure exerted by unforeseen situations can result in impactful uh, solutions. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'll move on to introduce the speakers to you. In between that, if you have any questions, uh, please, uh, those who are in the floor, please direct your questions to Teresa and Brian who are there in the floor. Or you can also use the chat box to uh, for the people who are present virtually. You, you can put your questions over to us on the chat box. So we have uh, John Murray. Uh, I'll hand over John to introduce himself, and he's going to take part as the private investor or investing part. John, over to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is John Murray. I'm I'm uh, I'm here in uh, Silicon Valley in California. Um, I've been uh, been involved in uh, angel investing for uh, for a number of years. My background is in uh, uh, software engineering and artificial intelligence. And um, in addition to uh, investing and consulting, I have been um, uh, I have been involved in several uh, several startups, and uh, at least one of them was reasonably successful. So um, I'm uh, I'm in a situation where I can uh, uh, help everybody or help lots of people to uh, to understand the yeah, the, the angel investment uh, uh, ecosystem here in Silicon Valley. Uh, my background is um, uh, I'm from Ireland, and I've got uh, I've got lots of connections with uh, through my family uh, throughout Europe. So I'm looking forward to uh, to participating, and um, I think that's uh, that's enough for me for, for for now. Thank you, John. Uh, Lena, I'll give you the floor for your introduction. Before that, probably I'll, I'll give a few words about you, if it is okay. So sure, Lina, Lina Pishi Thomas is the director of Global Business and Roads. She's going to give us her views and her point of views on the side of innovation management, spin-off, and to market, go to market side. Uh, Lina has been, uh, I, I've been, I've known her for around seven years, eight years now. She is, um, She's an expert in climate change mitigation, uh, energy. She's working in uh, climate change mit mitigation, energy environment, transport, biotech, ICT sectors, uh, with various uh, countries like US, Europe, Asia Pacific origins uh, region. So uh, her business global inroads uh, deals with international clean energy, environment, transport technology, uh, innovation access through technology to the Indian market. And she has also uh, been uh, working in renewable energy and clean tech spectrum, and also in climate change. So Lena, I give you the floor. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Nandu. It's um, a real pleasure to uh, join this uh, session. I think it's a very important um, uh, topic, something we are discussing uh, every day. Certainly, the world is in a state of, uh, you know, uh, crisis. Uh, India is uh, is definitely on the top of it. And I'm sure uh, the global media 
uh, is is uh, sharing about what's happening, uh, you know, in the country. And uh, but you know, there are two perspectives to what's happening in India. One is all of the you know suffering you see with the growth of the crisis, the number of cases. Um, uh, also, the economic impact uh, on the economy, especially the daily uh, wage earners and the migrant laborers uh, in the country. But there is another uh, area, uh, which is uh, what my talk is going to focus on today, uh, where there has been a continuous uh, growth of uh, innovation-related activity, especially where in the time of this crisis, technology has completely leaped forward, uh, you know, in, uh, in India to, uh, to make a difference, uh, to make life easier, and also to help uh, the people, whether it's at the business or uh, in their, uh, in their uh, public or private life or in their work life, really adapt to this um, uh, situation. So, I decided to keep uh, the entire presentation on a highly optimistic note, uh, but that does not mean, uh, you know, we are not uh, mindful. I mean, I'm not mindful about the entire situation in India, but I'm a diehard optimist and I want to focus, uh, you know, today about uh, uh, on the possibilities, uh, what can really work. Uh, so uh, uh, today I really want to touch upon a few things. First, I want to talk a bit about the work, uh, you know, our company is doing in the area of innovation management, how we have ourselves adapted to, to coping to this uh, scenario, working in the cross-border space. Um, then touch a bit about how India is adapting. And, uh, you know, what have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, my learnings, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what one needs to focus on in the uh, innovation arena, especially when it comes to, uh, work, you know, focusing in, in the cross-border space. And um, uh, so, yeah, over to what we do as a company. As you can see, the title of what I want to focus on today, when it comes to innovation management, how can we bring technology access and focus deployment to solve global challenges, be it COVID-19, be it addressing the uh, UN SDGs, that is what you know GBI was set up to create and and um, and and make happen uh, 11 years ago. So, um, what we have done in the last uh, over the last decade is really worked extremely closely with governments. Uh, international business networks um, uh, and created meaningful exchanges between Indian and international business and innovation entities. Uh, and most importantly, through these networks and relations, whether it's you're a university or a government or uh, you know innovation actor or an SME or a startup, really help, helped with you know um, actual market access. Uh, uh, promoting soft landing, uh, looking at transnational entrepreneurship, bilateral exchange, and most importantly, how do you really bring uh, an innovative technology into an emerging market like India, which has its own set of problems uh, to deal with logistically and infrastructure-wise? How do you really create a sound business process to make sure that companies benefit uh, uh, you know, do business while also driving change. So, you know, what we went on to do, I mean, I'm, I'm sure most of you who have done cross-border innovation, whether you're a university or a technology company, uh, have, you know, uh, visited countries. You've been on delegations, you've had a lot of meetings, and you've probably come back feeling a bit you know, okay, what's going to happen next? I've come back to my country, uh, you know, will, will something really work? So what we uh, set out to do is really create a process, whether you are scouting for a technology or whether you're deploying one, really set out an innovation management process, which is a combination of, you know, online tools, as well as offline hands-on support to help you with your innovation management, uh, uh, you know, at a cross-border level. Most importantly, uh, you know, the importance of, especially in COVID times, uh, you know, we've moved a lot towards using our online tool called the Global Technology Interface. You can see the link there. Uh, earlier, you know, we would really bring uh, companies, uh, they would set up meetings for them, help them develop pilots, which is still relevant. But today when travel is becoming difficult, 
uh, when um, companies cannot really uh, travel because of the whole COVID situation, we have really shifted a lot of activity to our online platform where technology companies can showcase their uh, products to uh, market adopters of these solutions anywhere in the world. And just like LinkedIn would allow, uh, actually help them to connect, follow, and chat on this online platform to create, develop business opportunities and develop business um, deals or build research collaborations. And also for um, foundations and governments and universities to develop programs online uh, uh, you know, uh, where they want to kind of get a group of companies, a group of researchers to work, let's say, from uh, Europe in India or India in the US. Uh, so really created that kind of online approach. So our online approach is, is, is really something that's been uh, taken up a lot more uh, in these days. And uh, the third area uh, where we have seen a lot of traction is uh, we set up what is called the Global Tech Experience Center simply to address the problem of how international technologies can be showcased within a local ecosystem like India. Uh, really, it's a physical space to demonstrate your technologies. Um, and uh, the question was, and now today, a lot of technology companies who again cannot travel and spend so much time in India are actually exporting their solutions and uh, using our support to, to install these demos so the local ecosystem can actually come and uh, experience them here on the ground. So this is another example of how um, when we used to bring delegations of companies to the and uh, set up meetings and help them, uh, you know, facilitate those uh, uh, business uh, opportunities physically, we have switched. Uh, to helping them through the online platform and also facilitating the demo uh, locally here in India for them. So all of these things we kind of adapted to post-March 15th, uh, you know, here in India, uh, knowing that uh, these, uh, these, uh, these are problems today. A lot of tech companies or governments had already invested in these programs. And how do you keep continuity? And one of the biggest learnings is in crisis, uh, the important point is not to give up and try to find the best way to maintain consistency and continuity so that, you know, uh, in that way, you, you not only help your stakeholders, but you also help in economic development and, you know, uh, activities and uh, to, to happen, which can actually make a positive impact for, you know, the, the stakeholders around you. So this is an example, you know, of a UK company that was initially going to visit India to, uh, uh, to do a demo of their air quality sensors. Uh, but now they are actually demonstrating it online on the online platform and uh, showcasing it in the Global Technology Experience Center, uh, completely pivoting their strategy for India to adapt to the new uh, situation. Um, secondly, we uh, just to give. I'm just you know taking you through a few examples. Uh, there are different programs, but we don't have all uh, you know evening or all night to kind of go through it. So I'll talk to you about some of the work we are doing with the European Commission. Here we were running a platform to connect EU and Indian innovation actors, whether it's incubators, accelerators, and startups. And we were hosting networking events in India and Europe, bringing together these stakeholders. So instead of having the events um, uh, physically, we kind of moved to having it virtually, uh, you know, uh, for them uh, in terms of activities and programs that we can implement. Some of the uh, figures, uh, you know, of the work we've been able to do as a part of the Europe-India Innovation Partnership, which connects incubators, accelerators and startups. Uh, we have set up some, uh, you know, platforms to connect um, food waste and agri-waste uh, uh, technologies across Europe and India, as well as, for example, we have a platform also on health and COVID in Europe and India, connecting startups that are active in the COVID uh, space along with uh, uh, startups, uh, you know, in India, who are also uh, working in the space so they can actually offer their solutions or potentially work together on co-creation. 
Uh, we've also worked with corporates to announce uh, uh, challenges uh, online where startups can actually address some of their problem statements and uh, uh, co-develop and co-create solutions for the Indian market. And here we had startups both from Europe and India apply to this call, which was anchored by Accenture Ventures here in Bangalore, uh, India. Further on, we have a Dutch investor that is scouting for uh, innovators from India uh, to uh, that they are selecting now to invest in and also scale, uh, you know, into the uh, uh, scale into the European market. Sorry, Nandu, how much time do I have? Two minutes. If you can, finish me? if you can finish quickly, that will be good. Yeah, great. So, you know, I had a lot of, uh, you know, points on how India is adapting to COVID-19 and I think I need to kind of uh, move on. And, uh, you know, my slides are available really in terms of how India is uh, growing its uh, digital infrastructure, how in spite of uh, the economic downturn, there are some really good rays of hope in terms of a lot of investment taking place in the digital transformation uh, you know, also companies like this to kind of adapt to COVID are also um, uh, adapting to more climate related solutions. And this is Flipkart is the, uh, you know, Amazon of India. And to deliver their goods now, they are adopting electric mobility and making a transition to 100% electric vehicles by 2030 for the delivery of goods, uh, you know, that uh, you would order on their uh, platform. So, I just want to leave a quick message, you know, uh, which we can take up in the question answer session, uh, you know, that I believe that uh, uh, this crisis can open many doors. Cross-border innovation is going to get bigger, not smaller because of this crisis. The world's going to get smaller, I believe. Uh, you know, uh, it might look like, you know, we are uh, growing apart if you look at the politics between all of the different countries. But I think innovators, uh, are really going to bridge the gap between countries and work in a more unified way. Um, uh, partnerships are going to become even more important to implement your work. And uh, the third uh, thing that I've noticed in the last two, three months of you know being in isolation and in COVID is that we need to think broader in terms of the geographies in which we operate in. You know, Earlier, we used to do just India, Europe. Today, we're looking at programs, India, Europe, Africa. US, Europe, India, Sri Lanka, South Asia, EU. So, you know, the whole uh, idea of innovation has transcended and I think uh, borders are slowly diminishing. So that's really the key message I'd like to leave uh, your all, uh, you know, all of you with this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Lina. Uh, thank you for the interesting uh, presentation and introduction. Uh, I'll, I'll, hand, uh, I'll want to... I'll, I'll move on to the next um, presenter. Um, it's going to be Fabricio Conicella. And uh, he is has been uh, in the field of innovation and technology transfer for the last 25 years in the area of uh, human health and life science, covering questions in project management, business development, general management, and he's also the president of Italian Science Park Association and also the vice president of LEC, Advanced Life Science in Italy. He's also the general manager of Open Zone and uh, ZQ, a research venture. So, uh, and he's also part of an acceleration, innovative corporate acceleration program. He has a lot more, uh, he's more related to SMEs and uh, and he's going to talk about acceleration and SMEs, innovation accelerator and SMEs. So I'll hand over the floor to Fabrizio. Thank you, Nando. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And thank you for the opportunity to share what we learn from the COVID experience. Uh, I will try my presentation to synthesize what we think could be a, a lesson that we can extract related to innovation management, innovation processes from the COVID uh, pandemics, and uh, what, how we 
implement such lesson in one of our initiative, the acceleration initiative. Uh, only if you were to explain uh, what Open Zone and Zeta Cube are, Open Zone is a science park located in Milano. We are a 100% private science park and we are only working in the health and life science field. Zeta Cube inside Open Zone is a sister company specialized in startup support and both organizations are owned by Zambon, that is a medium-sized Italian pharma company. Uh, what we learn, oops, sorry, because it's not uh, ah, moving. Uh, what we are supposed to do when there is uh, an emergency is to be prepared. To be prepared means uh, to try to manage uh, in a preventive way, all the different issues that we can face. Uh, such image that is coming from a study realized in the US uh, more or less five, six years ago, is trying to synthesize the different action that we are supposed to have in place to be prepared for an emergency. What happened with COVID was exactly the opposite. We were not prepared. Uh, we were not ready to cope with uh, the emergency. We were not prepared to manage the issues at the care system level. We were not prepared to measure the impact in terms of uh, economy, in terms of uh, capability to maintain a production level and so on. So something went wrong. What happened was that we tried to translate the experience that we developed in all the previous year in a partial solution to the issue. We tried to standardize the management of patients. We tried to support the healthcare system, trying to lower in the curve. And we tried to react with a palliative initiative to all the economic issues. What we call is what that action we call ultra fast innovation processes. What does it mean, ultra fast innovation processes? It means a rapid reaction using the knowledge that is already available to try to find a partial solution, maybe not the optimum, the optimum one, but the, the partial solution to the issue. To implement an ultra fast innovation process, you need to understand. The problem, and this is common to other innovation processes, but you need also to make a rapid inventory of knowledge and resources that are available. Why? Because you have to use such knowledge and all the emerging technologies, mixing solutions already available in a multidisciplinary environment with an integration of end user from the day one. It's a way to repurpose the already existing knowledge. And there are several examples during the COVID pandemics. This is probably one of the most known. The use of mask developed for laser with 3D printing application as a pulmonary support system. It was a, something of shocking because, uh, at least in Europe, we know quite well the use of such mask. It's really leisure mask, but we were able, in a rapid way, to move from uh, already existing knowledge, already existing technology, to a new product, responding to an issue that was not managed with our preparatory action. A second example is the methodology that we use to develop vaccine. I'm working in pharma. I'm aware that the usual way to develop a vaccine takes probably 10 years. We shrink the process. We innovate in managing the development process of a vaccine, trying to move from 10 years to less than one year. Uh, I think that you heard uh, what President Trump told that uh, uh, for November, the first batches of vaccine in the US will be ready. It's something that for someone that is coming from the pharma sector is shocking. We were used to have a medium to long term development process. We innovate also in that way. And we innovate in the way that innovation is scouted and nurtured. Uh, the EU versus virus hackathon was something of shocking. It was a virtual hackathon 
with more than 2,000 partnership, more than 1,500 meeting, and with 120 projects that moved from an early stage level to a level where they can be evaluated by investor. And we innovate a lot in the methodology that open innovation is used to reach that goal. Uh, for a pharma manager, it's something of really shocking because the ultra fast innovation process is based on repurposing or existing technology. It's not based on disruptive technologies. We have to use what we have because we don't have time to develop something of completely new. Obviously, there is a risk of uh, deceleration of uh, traditional innovation processes. But at the same time, it's something that could be parallel to traditional disruptive innovation processes. And obviously, it's changing and affecting also the way that we are using to do innovation managing. Because a repurpose knowledge needs talents. It's not easy. It's something of really difficult. It needs talents that are multidisciplinary, flexible, and able to move from one field of knowledge to another. It's, uh, it's an approach that requires open innovation system because you have to internalize knowledge that is already existing and that not necessarily is existing in your organization. It requires an adequate risk taking because there is always a risk. The fast to fail approach has been uh, used in a repetitive way inside the healthcare system and inside organization during the COVID pandemic. The fast prototyping and the fast test has been the rule. Last but not least, you have to focus on large scale adoption. Because if you use a solution only in one hospital, you are not solving the problem. You have to scale up immediately from the day one the solution in order to propose a systemic solution to the problem. So from a managerial point of view, it's absolutely difficult. What we try to do, uh, we are used to run a traditional acceleration scheme. It means uh, we scout inside the company the need. It's a quite long process. We try to formalize the needs. We try to standardize the priorities, transforming the priorities in a call. And usually such needs are quite specific. We try to change the approach. We move, for example, from a cure-based acceleration, it means pharma and diagnostic, on a care-based acceleration, where we are looking for companies that are able to follow the patient and the problem in their progression. We try also to have an holistic and flexible approach. We focus on digital health because we believe that digital health has such capability to be applied to different problems and to be easily adapted. And we mix the P4 paradigm medicine with such technological opportunity. Uh, only to remind you what is the P4 paradigm is a paradigm that interprets the healthcare management identifying four moments in the life of a patient where it's possible to predict a disease, where it's possible to prevent a disease, where it's necessary to personalize the therapy, the approach, and where is necessary to manage someone that is going out of a disease. And for who is aware about what is happening with COVID, all the four steps are important. The prediction and the prevention are key to lower the impact of COVID. The personalization requires the capability to block the infection when someone has the diseases. And more and more, we are, we are using already existing technologies to do that. But when the disease is blocked, the patient is not safe. There are demonstrations that it can be reinfected, and there are demonstrations that also patients that have not the diseases 
are bringing from that situation other problems, cardiovascular problems, for example, or pulmonary problems. So we try to use a such approach to identify technologies, particularly in two fields, both relevant for COVID, central nervous system and respiratory diseases. COVID is a strange infection. It's an infection that is affecting the pulmonary level, the brain level, the CNS level, and the cardiovascular level. We are not experts in cardiovascular, but we are experts in CNS and respiratory. So we mix the disease, the therapeutic area, and the digital health, trying to identify how digital health could support us in offering solution. And we identify four area where it's relevant, the use of digital health in COVID plus one. The first area are digital diagnostic, the capability to diagnose, the digital prevention, the capability to predict, to have digital biomarker able to identify in a really early stage the, the, the diseases, the capability to manage with remote technology the patient and the capability to use digital health to speed up the process of development of new solution. We identify a last priority. COVID demonstrated that we need a new way to interact. The difficulties in having a direct physical relation that has been substituted with teleworking, uh, remote uh, consulting, and so on, were all based on the transfer or already old experience to the new situation. We need to develop new ways, new technologies in order to do that activity. Uh, we launched a call in uh, May. So during the COVID pandemics, we received a lot of uh, uh, proposal, 50% uh, came out of Italy and 50% from Italy. We, do, we did the first selection, we select 26 uh, companies during the first selection. We already reselected the company, so we moved from 26 to 14, and now the 14 companies are in the last selection. We will run the acceleration during this autumn, maybe from uh, end October till end of November. And we will award, there is a monetary prize from 50,000 euro to 100K, uh, the three best technologies. And such monetary prize will be used also to leverage other funds coming from other organizations. And our approach is to continue the coaching activity also after the acceleration for a quite long period because we believe that that kind of ideas, and we are discussing about ideas that are on the technology readiness level between a three and five, so they are really in an early stage, require support for a longer period of time. And that's all. I tried to synthesize uh, our experience, what we learned, and now we implement the lesson learned. Yeah, I'm available to answer to questions uh, and uh, to respond to comments. Thank you. Thank you, Fabrizio. Uh, we'll move on to the next speaker, uh, who is Vesna. Uh, Vesna is the co-founder and CEO of Qmenta a neurogenerative and degenerative disease startup. Uh, she'll be talking to us uh, on medical image startup entrepreneur as a uh, medical image startup entrepreneur and a former researcher and a PhD uh, postdoc person who has been uh, through the path of uh, the people who, uh, who are following neuroscience. Uh, Vishna, I, I leave the floor to you. Thank you, Nando. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, um, uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, today I'll introduce um, my startup, Cumentum, um, and I hope that after this uh, talk, it's going to be one of those digital health solutions that was uh, initially for one very niche specific area of CNS and how we broaden it and, you know, uh, managed to repurpose some of our offerings uh, to be very useful for the current pandemic situation. But before I introduce uh, Cumenta, uh, I wanted to start with uh, introducing our team, uh, some of very exceptional people that's been one of the most uh, positive and resilient people that I've ever had the 
met in my life and have privilege to work every day in a very, you know, remote way um, now, but still very efficient. Uh, we are very international. So I'm from Macedonia. We are three founders. Paolo is from Portugal. He also has a PhD in neuroimaging. And Landon is from the States. Uh, he, he has a business background and he has successfully started and exited two companies. Since the beginning of the year, we brought in a CEO, Rob, uh, who has over 25 years of experience uh, on an executive role in life science. And he's been helping us a lot as we are in this big growth stage. And also, we've had the pleasure to have some really extraordinary people on the advisory board. Walter Gilbert, who is a Nobel laureate in uh, DNA sequencing and one of the founders of Biogen Pharmaceutical. Chris Llewellyn, senior partner at McKinsey. Bruce Rosen, who's the director of the Martino Center, the Harvard's Imaging Center, and Michael Fox, who's assistant professor also at Harvard at um, a laboratory for brain network imaging. So we've, with all these people and the team uh, behind Cumenta, we are about a little bit less than 30 people, also very international team with offices in Barcelona and Boston. Um, we've, we've been in business for about seven years and we are now in a growth stage um, and we've continued really I think even stronger, pushing forward innovation in time of COVID. So let's introduce what is uh, Cumenta, which we all often use the tagline uh, Google Maps for the brain. Um, but before that, I, I just want to say that um, basically what I, what, I, what I mentioned, we have offices in Boston and Barcelona. Uh, we work with some of the top institutions uh, worldwide. You can see Karolinska, Charité, NIH, uh, Bayer Pharmaceutical. Uh, most of our sales have been in the States, but we, it, there is a big shift now going um, mostly in EU, and I think this would be one of the topics of discussion on how we can uh, you know, work better uh, in, in different geographic areas. Uh, and we've been uh, doing pretty well, especially in the past year, and I'm very, very happy to, to say that despite COVID this year, we've done more revenue than the whole last year before. So um, it's, it's really important uh, to, to know that uh, it's been acknowledged the need of digital innovation in healthcare, and in this case, medical imaging. Um, it's estimated that 1 billion people worldwide suffer from brain disease. And this is kind of the, the, the big problem that Cumente is solving. Uh, most of these diseases are still incurable. And you might wonder, what is it about that? What is it about brain diseases that it makes it so difficult to cure? Um, and if you think about the brain, it's this precious organ that it's inside our skull. It's not that easy to just go in and take a sample you know, to, uh, to make a biopsy, like in the case of the liver. Uh, but luckily, we have this amazing technology like MRI scanners, CT scanners, that they can non-invasively take many black and white images in this case of the brain. So you might wonder why we have this amazing technology, but still um, we, we are struggling to really find effective cures for brain diseases. Well, the problem is that even at the state of the art institutions, still the standard clinical practices for radiologists to eyeball these images, to just look and scroll through these images and uh, write reports like this, which are very qualitative, like a few lesions are noted and numerous, uh, you know, dark holes in different areas. This is very, you know, this is a, a very subjective process. And it, it, there is evidence, there is a, actually a lot of statistics where radiologists, even the same radiologists, if it looks at the same patient data at different time points, let's say Monday and Friday, they will in 20 to 30 percent contradict themselves. And I've been suffering firsthand in, you know, uh, having a radiologist agree on diagnosis. So it's evident that we need uh, this kind of solution like we are offering in Cumenta, and that's the big value proposition. It's a cloud platform where you could just log in, uh, and then you can upload your data. It connects to the hospital systems, and then it runs AI analytics on the imaging data with one click of button, like play. And now you see this patient with MS, we have a detailed report where we see where exactly the damage is, what changed from different time points. And basically, neurologists can look at their patient's data as it is in 3D, and they can work faster, smarter, make better decisions about their patients. So um, you might wonder, so how does this relate to COVID? So when COVID happened, um, we, we realized that our platform has a huge potential to go beyond neuro, and we started our own initiative, Conquer COVID. And um, I think there is, we, we've put a lot of marketing effort and, and summarizing it in a very good uh, video. 
The COVID-19 pandemic is challenging global medical systems unlike any event in recent memory. To help develop countermeasures, researchers are working hard to design AI algorithms that harness the power of medical imaging to expose how the virus attacks the lungs and also how it attacks other tissues like the brain. However, there's a problem. AI imaging algorithms need data, and a lot of it, to be at their best. Now, there's plenty of data available, but it's scattered across hundreds of hospitals. So how can data providers, like hospitals, rapidly contribute their data so that AI developers, like researchers, can quickly and efficiently create the imaging tools the world urgently needs? The answer? Cumenta. Cumenta believes data saves lives. That's why we've developed technologies specifically designed to centralize large and complex medical imaging data sets. Cumenta is already in the COVID fight. We've donated our platform to a global multiple sclerosis initiative that's collecting and analyzing big data to improve the care of MS patients during the pandemic. And we're ready to do more. If you're a hospital ready to share your COVID data, contact us today. We'll guide you in easily and securely uploading your data and in accessing all the COVID tools developed on our system. If you're a researcher developing AI algorithms for COVID, we can help. Contact us to see how our platform rapidly organizes imaging data, simplifies collaboration, and accelerates AI development. Connecting data-rich hospitals with data-hungry researchers when it matters most. That's Cumenta. Together, we are stronger. Together, we can conquer COVID. So we have, uh, you know, some successful use cases, especially in um, in MS. We uh, we, we really uh, started this project uh, that was really needed to centralize information for, uh, you know, for symptoms from from MS patients, from their uh, neurologists, but also from patient registries. We already have around 10,000 patient records, and this is collected every day with published paper and coming new papers. And we have these initiatives that I already talked about. Uh, well, I didn't, but the video already explained. Uh, we have success cases, but we have also struggled to, um, you know, get more traction. And I think it would be very interesting to discuss uh, why we have a solution that can really connect uh, the, you know, the, the, the different parties that are that can really make a huge change for dealing with this pandemic situation, but there are certain, you know, um, regulatory or maybe different factors that influence this kind of collaboration on different geographic areas. Uh, I have much more, but I think I'm running out of time. So I, I even have a product demo. So I hope that that would come in some of the questions. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to, to take any questions and talk more about what we've done in COVID and outside in CNS space. Thank you. Thank you, Isna. So thank you uh, for all the presentation. We'll, we'll straight away move to the Q&A. Uh, we have a couple of Q&As coming up. Uh, around 10 questions now already have come up virtually and on from the floor too. So let me start with John. Uh, John, what is uh, what are we staring at? Uh, what are we staring at as more like, a, what is the future for innovation and entrepreneurship going forward in this concerned and uh, constrained world that is going to be? What is it going to be? Um, so one of the one of the thoughts that, that uh, it, it came up in a couple of the presentations just now, but um, a thought that has been uh, has been um, buzzing around um, uh, recently is the the extent to which um, access to investor capital has uh, has changed for um, for startup ventures. Uh, very much, uh, it was very much the case uh, until until the the, uh, the the pandemic. Very much the case here in uh, in Silicon Valley that that the the way. Um, the the way a startup company would access it uh, investor funding is is a face to face meetings doing investor pitches uh, to um, to venture funds and uh, angel investors over over the last few few months all all of that has gone online it's got it's all gone on to, into uh, zoom sessions and that has that that's had a a, a, a very interesting effect in that um, in angel networks across the world 
are all able to to uh, to connect to syndicate to uh, to pitch uh, 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 to enable in, um, ventures to pitch their companies uh, to investors all over the world and every day there are uh, there are pitches that uh, that investors can uh, can, can hear uh, it's 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 much more dynamic just in the last few months the the amount of um uh the number of of uh, companies that we hear uh, uh, doing their pitches and the the geographic diversity especially companies from uh, from Europe and from the uh, Indian subcontinent but that's to me that's a that's a, a a remarkable change and even when all of this pandemic is over i think that we're going to continue uh, continue seeing that uh, that uh, uh, network dynamic Thank you, John. Um, the next question uh, I'm going to ask is like John, Lena, Vesna, and even Fabrizio, you can also join in, uh, is about the tools uh, that can be used. Um, how could, um, what kind of tools uh, can new innovators and researchers use and uh, or need? and what is that? Uh, what are the do's and don'ts that uh, they have to keep in mind to compete uh, not only inside EU but also to the uh, outer world too? How do they equip themselves? John, if you can start up. Sure. Um, if, when I think of this in, from the from the point of view of. Um, uh, the entrepreneurship and innovation that is coming, uh, that is developing in, in uh, universities and uh, uh, other uh, research institutions. Um, one of the uh, one of the key things I think is the um, that we, we see a difference in different parts of the world. We see a different different approaches by the. Um, uh, by the research institutions in terms of technology transfer, for example, um, it's very much the case in um, in in sort of influential universities in the United States that they that they they, they pay a lot of attention to to uh, uh, structuring the technology transfer, to um, capturing the intellectual property, and the sorts of things that are important to. Um, uh, to to investors, especially investors in very early stage companies, um, I sense that there's not quite the same uh, attention to uh, to those issues in, in in certain other parts of the world, and um, which makes it a little bit more difficult, perhaps, for um, uh, for early stage ventures to uh, to actually get the funding and to to uh, uh, get um, uh, get get there get started um there's i think that the sort of tools that are that, that we're thinking of there are basically uh educational tools to promote uh entrepreneurship and innovation in business schools and in uh, in engineering schools especially lena your your mic Yeah, sorry about that. So one of the things I've, uh, you know, seen between uh, uh, startups or businesses that have given up uh, in, in this period and those that have really succeeded is uh, for the ones that have succeeded and uh, I've seen quite a, uh, you know, few of them is that from day one, they made the decision to make things work in this situation and have been extremely dynamic in adapting to each and every problem that came, you know, their way. I think nobody uh, uh, predicted what was going to happen. I think all of us, in, in whether we are in innovation management or innovators like um, uh, Vesna or ecosystem players like Fabrizio, uh, we have to stay on the ball, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, literally on a day-to-day -day basis, following not just health developments, but geopolitical developments. I think if you are in tune with the dynamic state of affairs today, uh, you know, and most importantly, how do you stay in tune 
you are uh, uh, helping your uh, end beneficiaries or your customers so at the end of the day the first thing you need to do is ensure that your customers don't suffer and they, you actually enhance their experience in this time so that you know uh, the the suffering doesn't multiply right so if you are able to hold your business together then you can help you know your customers hold uh, their business together and then the chain improves so this you know staying on the ball to this extremely uh, changing situation is the most important um, tool and what i believe is you should not be scared of it because one of the things mankind always evolved you know uh, right from you know if if uh, you know from when we were hunters to where we are in more evolved civilization we we always adapted very quickly to what needs to be done and i think this is the most important uh, lesson uh, you know that we uh, uh, you know a tool we all need to have uh, in the field of innovation yeah they have to go the extra mile listen up yeah i mean i can say first hand uh, you you got to be resilient like crazy and adaptive um we had to you know close our office and we had to start working remotely and when you're a small startup uh you know you have very limited resources and one thing about startup is that they can do a lot uh, especially well organized startup with very lim- limited resources everybody has different hats you know uh and we we we're working really hard together so we we had to really organize well how we are going to have daily checkings uh how we how we going to just uh, operationally continue executing because essentially we are an IT company so how we going to um be able to have a very visible you know um accountability uh for different tasks uh how are we going to track progress and how we going to do it in this remote way um and luckily we integrated a lot of tools for you know hr recruiting we have a, a tool we have tool for um you know like jira for for development we we are very much into adopting technology that's kind of like a, our second nature uh the other thing is marketing is becoming like very difficult because especially for healthcare companies where one of the biggest uh, sales events are these kind of conferences they all stopped and then they became virtual which you know conference to be virtual when it's uh, scientific it's okay you can you know uh, give the, the lecture scientific community can hear the lecture but then you're an exhibitioner and now you have to be paying for this virtual floor plan and you have to have virtual visits and it's a model that it's still not clear whether it works or not so we and, and we're just you got to experiment you got to fail a lot and just not quit reinvent try something else um the i think that the the biggest tool is to just be determined and resilient and try out new things and then on the investment side like uh, like john was saying everything completely changed so out of a sudden you're pitching you know at 2 a.m. <laughs> 3 a.m. there's no time you know you want to be able to pitch to as much as possible uh investors obviously especially if you're fundraising uh so you have to adapt to that also uh it becomes a little bit more difficult to because you know everything is done online but but you're adapting and um uh it's it's working you know you're learning as you go so Well, I can I can talk a lot on this topic but I think I I covered kind of like the main pillars that we had to uh quickly adapt to survive. Fabrizio you have anything to add? Yes I I think I agree that the capability to adapt uh, and to let's say to be a little bit creative in developing a new solution adapting such solution to the new situation uh, has been and this uh, another value i would like also to outline that there are issues that are not tool but we 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 are still challenging in trying to standardize what we realize uh, adapting our behavior to the new situation and we are still lacking or uh, let's say monitoring tool it means that uh, in the tradition in the usual way to work there are traditional monitoring tool uh, monitoring in term of performances productivity capability to reach result and so on uh, with the new normal uh, we have to invent something of new 
without returning to uh, an old situation where we link the, the presence in the office with the productivity because the world is changing. Now we have to develop uh, some new tool able to permit us to monitor our productivity by ourselves at home. And it's not easy. It's not easy because what is happening was not smart working. We simply move the work that we are doing in the office at home. Switching off, switching on the computer at seven o'clock, switching off the computer at midnight is not the good way to react to that situation. We use technological tool, but we need also methodological tool. We need to change something. And for the moment, we are still struggling and challenging because it's not easy. Yeah. So that, that's my call. I think what you mentioned, just if I may add, is that it's very important to uh, you know, align the OKRs uh, objective key results with KPIs, how you're measuring yeah. and have clear targets, and then do the performance uh, review on that. And like that for us was the best way to, to, to measure productivity. And, you know, it's not a factor anymore. It's not like you're checking and it's manual labor. It's a lot of creativity. And I think it should be more goal oriented rather than amount of hours that you're yeah. seeing in front of. I agree, Vesna, it's more difficult for medium to big organization because for a startup is clear. It's, it's easier. It's also funny for a startup. Yeah. But for a medium to big organization, it's a, it's a shock because medium to big organization are based on standardization. And you cannot use the same standardization tool that you are using when you are in an office. You cannot badge every morning. So you have to invent new tools that could be technological or methodological to permit to the worker to be empowered from one side and productive from a second point of view at the same level, let's say, that was the rule before the COVID pandemic. And this is something of new. I think it's, uh, it could be a, a way to innovate. <laughs> it's a, it's a, a field where uh, we need something of new. We need creativity from that. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, I, we have another question from the floor. Uh, the floor is asking, somebody from the floor is asking, uh, how, how could the EU and the rest of the world compete with each other or complement each other uh, or collaborate with each other for better innovation and therefore for uh, better entrepreneurship? Sure, I can start with some initial, uh, you know, comments on this uh, topic. Um, uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, areas where, um, uh, for example, um, European hardware companies, uh, you know, uh, would like to work with Indian software digital skill experts to kind of uh, develop and build uh, solutions uh, together. So there are two concepts that I'm seeing grow more and more. Uh, one is co-creation. That is, you, uh, uh, you kind of uh, meet uh, with uh, uh, complementary skills and you build something together at a cross-border level. The other uh, is transnational entrepreneurship. Basically, uh, when, uh, uh, where uh, you, know, you have uh, one uh, company uh, that has maybe a business idea and the other company that has maybe the skill to deliver, uh, you know, getting together and um, uh, to, to do business. And the third area that we are seeing, for example, is um, uh, which is a growing uh, activity and opportunity in India now is that the government of India wants to empower, for example, the small and medium enterprises in the country uh, uh, with technology. They believe that these companies can really grow if they have the right kind of technology. So they are creating platforms and um, we are a part of a few of them where uh, they want to connect uh, 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 European technology with Indian SMEs so that those SMEs could enhance their pro uh, productivity and grow, not just in India, but also in other international markets as well. And, uh, you know, the similar thing is also being encouraged at the startup level, uh, you know, whereas you could have a startup in Europe and a startup in India, 
and uh, you know how can they kind of uh, collaborate to leverage each other's uh, uh, markets and the third area is how can you um, uh, you know uh, uh, bring your technology to a country like india and have it manufactured here at scale uh, because india is a very large market and that scalability and demand can actually uh, reduce the price and increase uh, you know uh, the um, uh, the volumes uh, you know in a country and this could actually be adapted to a health tech activity or an agri tech or a clean tech or a, a iot manufacturing solution so there are multiple areas you know adandu to answer your question as to how uh, europe can collaborate more with uh, with other countries around the world and you know i focused a bit on india but these are some uh, i feel that these are really going to grow and even in the virtual scenario uh, you know it's an opportunity that the government of india is really continuing to push what you said is right lena because the world when when we are moving away from one country and we are looking at how could we share it with the other countries uh, the same production capacity not relying on one country alone this um, uh, this new stance towards india would would be a real welcome point and uh, as an investor i i would like to see some uh, startup who's going to come in and say you know what i can do this uh, can uh, do you have the volume yes we have the volume i will invest on you come on uh, i'm ready for you so that is the kind of uh, investment i as an investor also i am looking at uh, vesna and fabrizio do you have anything to say about this um, vesna sure. ladies first <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, I, I think that, uh, that there are different levels uh, or different directions that we can think. I mean, naturally, collaboration easier happens between different startups or SMEs in different geographic areas when they can together work better. I find that there should be a really big switch of mindset in terms of investment, especially in Europe. So, and I can I can tell you a concrete examples that we've been dealing with. Uh, not only in applying to grants, but also applying to you know VCs. Their investment directive is that the company should only be operating in Europe. So for us, having office yeah. in the states is seeing as something bad, you know, instead of seeing as a huge true. market opportunity. Or when we are applying to SME grants, you know, we are hiding the clients like big clients because you have to show that they have traction and we are looking okay we have to choose cases that are in europe and i've personally pitched at phase 2 on sme where one of the juries said well uh, it seems that they have great product but if we fund them then the money will go to the states uh, we were rejected i mean uh, for me for uh, maybe this will get me in trouble but i think that it's uh, these are the things that we need to you know openly discuss uh we we would like to be able to approach bigger markets bigger you know the geographic areas should be able to collaborate and uh we have found much better and bigger investment opportunities in the states than in europe with also in terms of valuation and um in terms of you know assessing risk Uh, and i think that if we want in europe we, we still have an office in barcelona most of our r&d is in barcelona but if we want to compete uh we we need to have a switch of mindset and uh, uh change some incentives uh from perspective of you know vc funds and how they operate to you know on government level uh how things are structured and yeah i This is this is great. I I have a I have a, an, a, a slide a slide here uh, that 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 illustrates a couple of these points that both Vesna and Nina have brought up. Uh, if I can share my screen, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, this one. So you can see the screen. Mm-hmm. It's it's a. Uh, this is from from pitchbook which is a um uh they do analysis of uh, of uh venture investments across the across the world um what what these these w- would you mind pay- zooming in uh, i cannot see oh, sure. much i don't know if other people can but i can yeah that that'll be helpful yeah is that better 
Yeah. Much it's, better, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what what the, what these tables is is basically saying there are uh, there the the company PitchBook is has analyzed the number of investments that have uh, that are been undertaken in uh, across the uh, across the world at the different stages of the um, uh, of the of the market angel angel and seed investments early stage and later stage. The reason that the the, the uh, Caretsu Forum is highlighted there is because uh, this comes from uh, from a uh, Caretsu Forum uh, slide deck. What what is basically being said there is the number of the, the number of investments in 2019 that are made uh, ac across the world, there are uh, certain companies and certain networks are, are very high on, on the list there. The reason the Caretsu Forum is so high is because that, that is a network of multiple uh, investment uh, chapters in different parts of the world. So the... Um, there are angel investor groups uh, in, in, I think, about 50 different locations. Uh, their their investor uh, investments have been aggregated into that um, uh, into that number. The, the numbers that are shown there that are quite high on the list. The other other item that that I, I wanted to draw attention to is let me just. Uh, um, it's probably easier here. Uh, at this, can you see where my my um, yeah. You see where my arrow is? On the early stage, Enterprise Ireland is listed. In the middle stage, Enterprise Ireland is listed again. And Enterprise Ireland again in the in the in the more, more active stage. Enterprise Ireland is the is the government in, uh, in industrial investment uh, organization. They provide seed funding to Irish companies to get them started. And they follow through in the later stages, as you can see on there. The the the, the key angle that they that that agency uh, takes is to 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 address the point that um, uh, that Vesna just made is their the, their attitude is that if you're if you've got more than five employees in your company, you are in the export business, unless you're running a hairdressing salon. Basically, all companies of any size at all in Ireland have to look internationally. They are they have to in order to in order to build. And I think that this is this is the, the sort of thing that you see in, in, within regional development organizations. The 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 promoting of, of an awareness, a recognition that your market is is much broader than just locally. And also that, of course, that you're, you you have to be able to draw on expertise and talent and funding from, uh, from beyond your your local uh, your local borders. I think that this is one of the key uh, uh, the, the key issues uh, in, in, in what we're talking about here. Uh, so yeah, Fabrizio, if I can comment, uh, let's touch also the dark side of the issue, of the topic. It's true, the world uh, needs more international collaboration. But, uh, and uh, Vesna mentioned such aspect that is common in every country, at the public system, there is still, uh, let's say, a uh, local myopia, where you have to see your market, you are to invest only in your market. And if there is an international expansion, is instrumental in the local growth. And this is a little bit against what is happening in business model of startups, where the business model require a flexible and a wide presence all around the world, not necessarily a presence at local level. It's normal that, particularly for public financing, one of the KPI is the number of job places created at local level. And this is stupid. This is stupid because it's not linked to the increase of value of the company. And also some venture capitalists, particularly the venture capitalists that are acting at local level, are focusing on companies that have to grow locally. Uh, Enterprise Ireland, 
has a good aspect, a positive aspect, but also a negative aspect. They are financing only company working in Ireland. And they are conceived, it is correct from that point of view, as a tool to boost economic growth in Ireland. So in reality, they are not a venture capitalist. They are a regional development agency that is using venture capital money as a tool to grow, to permit the growth of the local economy. And uh, it's, uh, that, kind, that dark aspect is a little bit against the idea to collaborate on a transborder uh, way. Absolutely. Because I know several companies that have a lot of difficulties in explaining to public administration and in some case to private investors that they have to locate in U.S. to grow. Because U.S. is far, or in China. And I suppose that also for U.S. companies, there is a similar, or Chinese company, there is a similar problem. It's easy to collaborate when you are doing R&D. It's a little bit more complex when you are uh, scale-upping. Because when you are scale-upping, the egoistic interest of the company is growing. So it's, there is also a dark aspect that we have to, to outline. So, so just I want to add, uh, you know, to this point that this is, uh, you know, a very important uh, problem for uh, uh, the world to fix. I mean, you know, Vesna also talked about it. You cannot create global investors if you're only going to fund them for a specific geography. And most of the challenges that we are trying to solve, I mean, uh, you know, whether it's in healthcare or any of the um, other impact technologies, these solutions should actually have the capability to reach people all around the world. And the minute a European investor says that I will only invest in a European company, that company has to show customers in Europe yeah. and uh, to kind of get the money. Now, how does it help then an innovation to reach uh, uh, not just United States, but countries like Africa, India, Southeast Asia, where these solutions are much needed? And if you want innovation to really impact lives, to drive the cost down, they need to kind of get manufactured in countries like India or China or the Philippines, where the cost of production could be lower. And you lower the price, not just for the European country, but for markets around the world. Until and unless, I think it's a very important education to European investors. And when I've interacted with them, I realized it's not the question of, their lack of interest, they've just not had the chance and opportunity to think about it this way. Like an investor is like trying to look for a pipeline of deals that fits a certain criteria, you know. So I think if, uh, uh, you know, if, they, uh, if there is some capacity building done uh, to kind of tell them about the actual scale of the opportunity that they are missing out on, because at the end of the day, it is about the numbers. And scale can be got from, you know, a European company like where Vesna's growing. I mean, US is a huge market. Brazil is a huge market. India, China, those are the opportunities that are going to help uh, companies like them grow. So this is really, um, you know, an important takeaway point, so to speak, a message to the audience that, you know, European investors need to learn and forums like this should actually help them learn about, uh, you know, uh, globalizing their view uh, to business deals and numbers. And, and if I may just to add some small thing, if you're a startup in healthcare area, being in, in, in Europe is very, very difficult to build traction. Yeah. I mean, the American market, you know, that the healthcare system is one unified system. We've, we've been, you know, going through hell with the, discussing with different, okay, it's everything under GDPR, but like different regulations, different way of operating. It's exhausting. And it's something that, that really, I think, prevents innovation, especially we're talking now about health and COVID, right? Mm -hmm. It's a big barrier for, for, for startups to show traction in Europe. And Europe has to, we need to change mindset because there is a huge drain of startups who are starting to look elsewhere, go elsewhere. Um, I'm going to a lot of, well, now virtual startup meetings, but startup meetings where, you know, the most frequently asked question is, uh, how can I flip my company to the States? That should be alarming. And I think that we need to start 
thinking um, about this because eventually this will become a big problem for, for Europe. Yeah, and at the same time, if I can comment, we have a lot of difficulties in attracting startups in Europe. Startups that are bringing innovative projects because they are absolutely aware about the complexity of the European system. So I agree with Vesna, this is a, an element that we have to solve in some way at the European level. It, it is true that uh, the, the, the comments are all valid. So the exodus towards USA or any foreign, uh, foreign country by startups has to be uh, limited. Probably it can start right from localizing the workforce. Yeah, that is going to be a challenge. That is always going to be a challenge. On, on, in regards to the enterprise island, uh, there are two things that help uh, them. One is the size, uh, the geographic size of the country. Uh, it's probably because of the island nation that, or even if you take Japan, who is promoting uh, industries to go and invest on uh, or move away from one certain geography to other geography. So that is one point. And, you and regarding the investment, if you are searching for investment, target the right person. How we say in investing, target the right investor who is going to invest on you. Probably that is one solution that an, a startup or an innovator or an entrepreneur can take up and target the right person. And uh, just to give you a small example uh, to, the, to the general audience, uh, a couple of years before there was a uh, defense company from India uh, who were making uh, defense equipments and uh, they were not recognized in India. Uh, they, they developed their product in India, but they, they were not recognized in India. What they did was they sold uh, their equipments in Peru for 300 million. And once that made the news, the whole Indian market turned, it, it was a Bangalore based uh, company. And they looked at them behind and now uh, that was the start when India started pushing their defense, uh, Make in India program on defense. And as soon as they hit the news, every government official started to go to them. And now they have a bigger, uh, they have a bigger say in the, in the market now. So that is, that is one example that happened and uh, regarding the, uh, as an investor, when I see it, uh, even in the local, we have the same problem. So if, if in India, in Northern India, is the, the guy is from, the entrepreneur is going to be from Northern India and he's going to come to Southern India. He wants to do a month. We would like a subsidiary over here. Probably that can be explored. So those, those kind of things, uh, there are, what I can say is that there are things to benchmark and learn from, uh, as you all guys said, that there are things to benchmark from. What we have to do is like learn from others, adapt it quickly. So uh, it, it not only goes like innovate fast and fail fast, like go to business fast and fail fast too. So, so there, there are... Uh, a couple of things that, that came to mind uh, as we were talking about the, uh, especially the issue of um, getting uh, getting some traction for healthcare and um, uh, uh, medical products in um, and needing to 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 uh, to have a United States uh, component. I think there are a couple of things here that part of the reason I think may be at play is. Um, that they, there's a, a large amount of funding available, U.S. government funding available through the NIH, National Institutes of Health, and um, that that's very valuable for startup companies because it's non-dilutive. Uh, it's it's an investment in the in the product. The company receives the funding, but the NIH doesn't take an equity stake. So being able to collaborate with an entity in the United States that is eligible for that sort of funding is 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 valuable. There are also programs where 
um, the, uh, the 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 local NIH funding will be can be made available as um, complementary funding to uh, an equivalent uh, equivalent funding uh, given by another uh, another agency in another in another country. So there's matching funding programs. The, and the other the other element in terms of healthcare is the is the FDA approval process that it is so um, uh, so structured and and so ubiquitous that that if if you're if you're coming up with a product and you you go through that 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 chain of FDA approvals, um, it's it it basically it works for the rest of the world, and the investors here, life sciences investors here, really have a good. Uh, a good handle on on that process and where the injections of funding is needed to move the product from one level of FDA approval to the next. Now we, we're you. just finishing the last part of the <laughs> FDA approval, so <laughs> it's. Uh, uh, so I know so, all about uh, the process. Yeah. So guys, we have spoken about a lot of stuff, a lot of things that we have shared over here. Uh, so before we, it's time to wrap up the whole session, uh, I believe, so we already have it done, um, a message from the uh, administrators. So let's wrap up uh, with our thought views, quick thought views, two minute talk, uh, thought views, uh, probably from Vesna we can start. Now, what would we like to see? Um, what would we like to see in this open science forum? Vesna? Oh, well, uh, if if part of what I'm talking here reaches regulators and you know changes mindset, I would be very very happy. Uh, I, I've got to say that the big problem for us, you know, in going forward in the you know medical field in, in digital healthcare, has been this EU US privacy shield and just just pr problems with with. Um, uh, Problems with data issues, with medical data issues, especially collaborative pro projects between US, Europe. We haven't yet gone beyond, but but it, it's been really difficult. Um, this conquer COVID. So we, we are in this pandemic situation when there is need to, to find new imaging markers. We are offering a solution for free. Uh, and the hospitals are the hospitals are in a need for some kind of automated process, let's say, to, to, to help the radiologists not burn out and work smarter, but they are still hoarding data and they still don't feel comfortable to collaborate. Developing one method, uh, an AI tool, you know, uh, there are some data sets that are, you know, launched from, um, released from China and everybody's developing the AI tools on these data sets and the the researchers then they say, well, this tool is immature. We cannot put it in clinical practice because we need to validate it on different data sets. So there is this big need, but there is a big problem because of um, uh, you know uneasiness, I guess, obscureness of what it means with GDPR. Can I even even if, if you're compliant, can I trust and you know give my data? How can we make progress, especially now when we have you know, a, a, a real need to, to, to do this progress when we are still struggling uh, to, to move ahead uh, on this level. Uh, that for us has been a big challenge in our conquer COVID. I mean, things are moving, but they're moving way too slow. We have a perfect technological solution that is ready there that we even open it for free. Uh, hospitals do not want to donate data researchers do not want to put their tools in a commercial ready solution because that means that they are moving to the dark side and everything is driven by um, you know monetary uh, gains uh, who creates jobs you know they, 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 we, we need to really uh, we are here to make impact all of us together and we need to change mindsets uh, and I believe that that's possible but this kind of issues needs to be discuss uh you have to leave your ego <laughs> out of the panel you know and discuss in a very transparent way uh and be really oriented towards solutions not towards this is a problem and this is the obstacle and this is the obstacle so that's kind of my my summary Fabricio? 
Yes, uh, fully aligned with what Vesna was saying. We need a more, uh, let's say, entrepreneurial approach. Entrepreneurial approach means the capability to manage risk and the capability to be focused on the delivery of a solution because particularly in the health field, we are covering an ethical role. We are developing the solution that save lives. And if we put too many obstacles, the risk is that that solution will not reach the patient. And particularly in Europe, where there is a so fragmented system, it's always an issue for a startup. They are not able to develop one product that fits for all regulatory system. Every time they have to restart. And also universities that are pushing out technology and scientific results, particularly in Europe, and it is a huge difference with US, they are not focused on the impact of research results. They have not an entrepreneurial approach. They have to develop an entrepreneurial approach. It's not the dark side of the moon. It's something that is normal. You are doing research not because you are developing knowledge, but because your research is useful to solve a problem. I know that this is a, probably a rude approach, but it's something that we have to insert in the DNA of the new generation of scientists and as consequence. It's something that has to enter in our culture. European culture is different from US culture. We are still thinking that university is something of the teaching of the reality, where there is someone that owns the knowledge and transfer the knowledge to someone other. It's not true. University are part of a system where there is not a good technology transfer, there is no job creation. See, if there is no job creation, there are no taxes. If there are no taxes, there are no resources to invest in research. So more, a more entrepreneurial approach, a systemic entrepreneurial approach is something that I would like to see in the future. Lina? Well, um, uh, I think there's a huge opportunity now to bring EU technologies, whether it is, uh, you know, at an SME stage or at a startup stage uh, into India. Uh, and uh, this is a very good time to do that because of the kind of policy environment and the business environment as, uh, as well. Two very uh, good examples and opportunities I want to present of many is uh, we have launched a project with, uh, uh, you know, uh, IKEA Foundation and Commonland Netherlands mm -hmm. to track agroforestry innovations and scout agri-tech innovations from around the world to bring it to India for uh, sustainable uh, agroforestry, agri-tech um, agri and sustainable agriculture pr practices for rural communities. So uh, we are trying to build, um, you know, uh, rural communities in a sustainable manner and create livelihood opportunities and bring uh, the right kind of agri-tech, agroforestry solutions to this uh, project. So we'd be very happy to invite European innovators to uh, join us in this uh, program and also to present to them concrete business opportunities. The second area that where I see a very big opportunity is we are working with thousands of SMEs in India that want to manufacture uh, uh, very, very innovative, disruptive, IP-driven European solutions uh, and technologies in India. Uh, and uh, uh, also, that, that is one aspect. The second thing is technologies to improve the efficiency of manufacturing by SMEs in India. So whether it's Industry 4.0, uh, you know, IoT solutions that could do that. So, you know, uh, you know I, there are a lot of other areas, but I just wanted to focus my message on these two. Uh, and broadly um, uh, say that, you know, it's a very good time uh, if you're a European technology company to start harnessing the opportunities in a market like India. Thank you. John? Uh, I, I would, I would echo in particular i would echo the comments that uh, that uh, fabricio made about the the need to change uh, to change the culture within um, uh, within the universities in uh, in europe i think this is particularly the case 
uh, in continental Europe, when you look at the, the com companies uh, spinning out and, and technology transfer from universities in, in the United Kingdom, it's quite there's quite a large number um, across Europe. The United Kingdom is is the is the largest uh, source of uh, of technology transfer from universities, and the impact of Brexit is going to have uh, have an have an effect there. And it it, it would I'd be very keen to to see uh, the. Uh, the entrepreneurial spirit, the innovation, the build-up in, in in engineering schools and medical schools uh, within uh, within Europe to see a lot more um, awareness of the uh, the techniques of um, of yeah, identifying your intellectual property, protecting it, and uh, transferring it uh, off campus and into uh, into a commercial uh, commercial environment. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so to just to wrap up, uh, there are a couple of uh, pointers that I am, um, or uh, tag points or uh, hash point, hashtags that I uh, came across the whole day. One is the passion, time to market, pivoting, jack of all trades while expertise, partnerships, collaborative thoughts, tech savvy, uh, 200 years of research, quick research, early training, fail, innovate fast, fail fast, know what you want, uh, both personally and professionally, and also a big change of mindset. So uh, I'm sure that we'll be uh, having a lot of questions when we, uh, at the end of the day, uh, more questions than answers. So, which is a good thing for a start. And uh, to in order to uh, continue this discussion, uh, we are coming up with a portion paper. The whole uh, Euroscience is coming, ESOF is coming up with a portion paper, which we would like each and every one of you to, uh, every viewers, uh, the speakers, uh, to contribute and be part of it. Uh, so we will uh, we will share and uh, we we will share and uh, what do you say? Like I'll just share. This one. This is our uh, email ID. So, if you want to connect with us, if you want, if you have any questions, please shoot down your questions to Teresa Fernandez at euroscience.org and Brian dot uh, at euroscience.org. Uh, we would like to hear your comments. We would like to know you. We would like to work with you. Any uh, any any partnership is an open uh, thing over here. And we will be following this discussion with our speakers who are going to give us some sessions in the future, uh, individually taking out uh, a part. So uh, each each one of the uh, ups, the speakers and myself, we are always there to help you out, those innovators and uh, entrepreneurs. And let I don't know, probably if you give me a good uh, product and I'll be interested to invest too. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Um, have a nice day and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.